sorry I'm not able to be with you in person today. It turns out that the memorial service for my friend Danny Helms down in Arkansas, who passed away a couple of weeks ago, was scheduled for uh, Saturday, yesterday, and the elders were kind enough to allow me to go down for that, and so that's where I am this weekend. If all goes as planned, I'll be flying back to Detroit uh, this afternoon. But I hope you enjoyed the reading of the account of Jesus' birth a few moments ago. And what I want to do this morning in just a brief lesson is to expand a little bit on what we started thinking about last Sunday. Remember in John 1 verse 18, John tells us that Jesus came into the world in order to explain God to us. Uh, he came to be a living commentary on deity. He shows us what the Father is like. And in light of that, given the season that we're in, we ask the question, is there anything that we can learn about God from the Christmas story? From, is there anything that we can learn about who God is from the particular way that he chose to enter into the world? And I believe there is. Now, last Sunday, we suggested that one thing we can learn about God from Christmas is that he's humble. And this morning, I want to add just two more thoughts to that. The first one is that Christmas also teaches us that God is approachable. I mentioned that uh, uh, the idea for these lessons came from a wonderful book by Philip Yancey called The Jesus I Never Knew. And in that book, he uses a personal illustration that I think uh, really makes this point well. He says, I learned about incarnation when I kept a saltwater aquarium. Management of a marine aquarium, I discovered, is no easy task. I had to run a portable chemical laboratory to monitor the nitrate levels and the ammonia content. I pumped in vitamins and antibiotics and sulfa drugs and enough enzymes to make a rock grow. I filtered the water through glass fibers and charcoal and exposed it to ultraviolet light. You would think, in view of all the energy expended on their behalf, that my fish would at least be grateful. Not so. Every time my shadow loomed above the tank, they dove for cover into the nearest shell. They showed me one emotion only, fear. Although I opened the lid and dropped in food on a regular schedule three times a day, they responded to each visit as a sure sign of my designs to torture them. I could not convince them of my true concern. To my fish, he says, I was deity. I was too large for them. My actions, too incomprehensible. My acts of mercy they saw as cruelty. My attempts at healing they viewed as destruction. To change their perceptions, I began to see, would require a form of incarnation. I would have to become a fish and speak to them in a language they could understand. A human being becoming a fish is nothing compared to God becoming a baby. And yet, according to the Gospels, that is what happened at Bethlehem. The God who created matter took shape within it, as an artist might become a spot on a painting or a playwright, a character within his own play. God wrote a story only using real characters on the pages of real history. The Word became flesh. You know, in most religions of the world, the dominant emotion experienced when people approach God is fear. And to a great extent, that was even true among the Hebrews in the Old Testament. Uh, you might think, for example, about that famous scene in Exodus 19, where God descends on Mount Sinai uh, in preparation for giving Moses the law. We're told that there was thunder and lightning and the sound of a trumpet blast. And the mountain itself was shaking and smoking. And the Hebrew people, uh, the Bible says, were trembling with fear. And eventually they came to Moses and says, Moses, we want you to tell us what God says, but don't let God speak directly to us or we'll die. You might think about the temple and the fact that it had that inner sanctum, that place called the most holy place in which the high priest could meet with God, but only one time a year. And as you remember, according to the law, if, if anyone else other than the high priest ever went in that room, he died. 
And even if the high priest went into that room at any time other than what was stipulated in the law, the high priest died. They understood very well that it was a serious thing to enter into the presence of God. Approaching God was a fearful thing. But contrast that with Jesus coming into the world as a baby. What in the world could be less scary than a little baby? As Yancey says, in Jesus, God found a way of relating to human beings that did not involve fear. Like the keeper of an aquarium becoming a fish, God became a human being and said, in effect, look, I'm one of you now. I'm here to help you, not to hurt you. You don't have to be afraid. You can trust me. Just look at how Jesus related to his own disciples after beginning his ministry. In John chapter 15, he says to them in verses 14 and 15, You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Even as a man, Jesus could have chosen to relate to his disciples differently than he did. He could have kept his, different, uh, his distance from them. He could have chosen to uh, treat them merely as servants. But instead, he got down on their level. He regarded them as friends and even served them, washing their feet. Now, don't get me wrong. There is still a time for us to show reverence for God. There's a time for me to get down on my knees and, and even on my face in abject humility before the sovereign creator of the universe. But I can also uh, talk to God in, as I'm driving down the highway, sitting in my car, having, and have a, a casual conversation with the Lord as if he's sitting next to me and, and as if he's my best friend, because he is. I can do that because... Through Jesus, it's possible for us to approach God on familiar terms. I can approach him as a friend, and that is absolutely incredible. Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Another thing I believe Christmas reveals to us about God is that he identifies with the weak. Yancey writes, as I read the birth stories about Jesus, I cannot help but conclude that though the world may be tilted toward the rich and powerful, God is tilted toward the underdog. You remember in Luke chapter 1, when Mary goes to visit her relative Elizabeth, when both of them are pregnant, she sings a song, and one of the lines in that song is, God has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And that's a characteristic portrayal of God in the scriptures. Uh, it, we talked last week about the fact that God could have chosen uh, to arrange the circumstances of his birth very differently. Jesus could have been born to royalty. He could have been born in a palace, but he chose instead a birth that would cause him to identify with the poor and the oppressed. Uh, we know that Mary and Joseph were, in fact, poor. How do we know that? Well, you remember that in Leviticus chapter 12, uh, there, there is a law that lays out what a, a woman is to do after she has a child. The law of Moses says, when the days of her purification are completed for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, whether a male or a female. Notice verse 8. But if she cannot afford a lamb, 
Then she shall take two turtle, turtle doves or two young pigeons, and the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. Well, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 2 that eight days after Jesus was born, they go to the temple in order to present him before the Lord and to carry out uh, what the law requires here in Leviticus chapter 12. But Luke indicates to us that Mary gave the offering in this exception clause. She evidently didn't have the money for a lamb, and so she had to give the offering that was allowed for those who were poor. They were evidently poor. We also know that they were oppressed early on after Jesus' birth. We talked last week about Herod's attempt to kill Jesus soon after his birth, and uh, Mary and Joseph took him and fled to Egypt as refugees. So you've got this poor, uh, unknown Jewish family against the king of the land. Now, who's the underdog in that battle? God has always stood with and for the weak and the oppressed of the world. Let me read to you just a few sample passages from the Old Testament. Psalm 9, verse 9 says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Psalm 146, verse 7. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. Psalm 72, verse 13. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. And Isaiah 41, verse 17. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. But I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Those are just a handful of passages of so many more that we could uh, cite that portray God as someone who is deeply concerned for the poor and the needy and the oppressed. And even in his birth, in the way that he chose to enter into the world, Jesus identified with the weak and the oppressed. And as he grows up and begins his ministry, uh, wasn't that mostly to the poor and the oppressed? He has compassion on them. He heals them. He spends time with them. He stands up for them. And he teaches his disciples to do the same. Uh, one of his disciples, James, uh, his half-brother, who actually didn't become a believer until after Jesus' re resurrection, uh, writes these words in James 1, verse 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. God still identifies with the weak. Those are at least three things that I believe that Christmas reveals to us about our God. He is humble, he is approachable, and he identifies with the weak. And those are three very good reasons for us to praise our Lord as we meditate during this season on his birth.